dinosaurs. The word means literally terrible lizard. They've fascinated the minds of children and adults alike since the discovery of their fossilized bones in the mid-1800s. Thousands of TV programs, movies, books, magazines, and radio shows have been dedicated to them and the time when they roamed the Earth. But when was that time? Starting with Charles Lyell in the late 1700s came the idea that the layers of rock and sediment we see around the world took millions of years to form. This ultimately led to the theory that the dinosaurs lived 65 million years ago and in some strange catastrophe were wiped from the face of the earth, never to be seen by man. Today the idea that dinosaurs and man were separated by 65 million years is accepted as fact, with little question by most people. But is it true that man has never seen a living dinosaur? What does the fossil record say? Does the fossil record give us evidence of man and dinosaur living contemporaneously? And if there was such evidence, what would be done with it and how would today's academia respond? Join us now as we journey on an adventure, digging into the past, exploring the present, and uncovering the truth about dinosaurs, man, and their footprints in stone. Nestled in the rolling hills of north central Texas is a little town called Glen Rose. This small town with a population of around 2300 has been a tourist attraction since the mid-20th century. The attraction that has drawn hundreds of thousands of people in this tiny town centers around the discovery of dinosaur fossil footprints along the banks of the Biloxi River. These dinosaur footprints, however, are not the only footprints to have been uncovered here. In 1908, a massive flash flood tore through the Biloxi River, causing Volkswagen-sized boulders to be washed down the stream. The flood caused the river level to rise 27 feet, and the erosion that resulted from the flood exposed new layers of rock in the bed and shores of the river. When this thing flash floods, it, and it rips through here. Uh, now, before they dammed it, this was the only river that was undammed in Texas. And for every um, mile, it drops seven feet. So back in 1908, when, the, when that flash flood came through here and ripped up all these layers in 1908, no one ever seen a dinosaur tribe. Ernest Adams and his brother George Adams are credited with finding the first theropod footprints. Robert Summers grew up in Glen Rose and was a close friend of Bull Adams, as he was nicknamed. Well, I was privileged to have lived right next door to a man we called Bull Adams. Ernest Talbert Adams. He just uh, was about a hundred steps away from my house. And he was such an interesting fellow that uh, he loved talking about Indians, dinosaurs, you just name it, everything a kid likes to hear. And uh, was quite an expert in most of those fields. So what would be uh, your relationship with him and the tracks? Well, uh, probably no relationship between me and him in the tracks, except for the fact that he was the first one that I know about that knew what they were. His brother George had found them uh, during the summer. He was just kicking around rocks uh, up the creek here in town. Bull Adams was friends with another resident named Charlie Moss, and in 1909, on one of their numerous swimming excursions in the Paluxy River, Bull showed Charlie Moss another set of tracks. He referred to them as giant man tracks. At least 15 local people testified to seeing the same set of tracks in that area, which became known as the Fourth Crossing Tracks. Moss said about the tracks, they were so plain that you could see where he was walking, and then he got up on the balls of his feet and commenced to run. But it was uh, Charlie Moss who discovered the first human footprints when he came back from the war, was recuperating in his hometown. First human fo footprints among dinosaur footprints after a spring flood had ripped up the ledge. Well, Bull Adams examined them, and Bull Adams, the scholar, Oxford scholar, who grew up here as well, um, thought that actually, since he was an anthropologist, he felt that the earliest evidence of man was at Glen Rose. Emmett McFall, another local resident of Glen Rose who owned property adjacent to the Paluxy River, claimed to have first seen the giant man tracks in 1923 when he was 28 years old. 
What do you remember about your grandfather Emmett and what he found and saw? Well, of course, personally, I first remember in the, in the 50s, in the early 50s when I was a young boy, but he bought this place in 1929. And uh, just a year or two after he bought it, they had a big flood, and he'd uncovered some of the tracks that are visible today. But Emmett McFall, when we went to his house, it was the most unusual house, I guess it's still over there, and he had some of the tracks around a tree. Uh, and uh, he's the one that, uh, he and uh, Cecil Dart are the one that told me where they were. And then I take field trips every year. When the stock market crashed in 1929, the Great Depression hit, and many people did just about anything they could imagine to earn money. Several local residents, like Jim Riles and his wife, took up the side occupation of chiseling dinosaur tracks out of the riverbed and selling them to tourists. During the, during the 30s, he had a man that worked for him that lived here on the place named Jim Riles, and Jim uh, dug out what we call human tracks and, and dinosaur tracks, and they sold them to different people. To the residents of Glen Rose, Texas, the idea of man and dinosaurs living together was not so strange. Before the 1930s, the theory of evolution had not become widespread throughout the public education system. As a result, the residents in and around Glen Rose thought nothing of these giant human footprints in stone. The amazing thing about it is that I wasn't amazed at the time. And we were looking at these tracks, and I, I walked over to the side and I said, well, they must have been playing with the kids down here because here's some boy or man tracks right alongside of them, but I didn't think he'd think about it. And uh, until much, much later, I found out the significance of man tracks with dinosaurs. I didn't, I didn't have a problem with that. And uh, until I started learning some of the things they were teaching in schools, man came along a long time after the dinosaurs, supposedly. A very clear and pristine human track was extracted by Riles and then sold to a Dr. Cook in Cleburne, Texas. Well, I, I guess that was in the 30s, or it might have been in the 40s. He dug out a real good one that he sold to, a, he was a doctor in MD over in Cleburne in Johnston County, and it was perfect. Uh, I never seen the actual track. My dad and my granddad did, but I seen pictures of it. But it, it had just perfect five toes, arched the foot, uh, heel just like that we have today if we was to step in mud and, and then the mud would harden, you know, and fall. I mean, it, it was perfect. Thousands of people claim to have seen this track, which was on display on the wall of the Cook Medical Clinic. Unfortunately, upon Dr. Cook's death, it is believed by his son that the track was stolen and is still missing to this day. In the late 1930s, early fossil hunter Roland T. Bird came to Glen Rose looking for fossils and dinosaur tracks. His initial interest in Glen Rose was sparked by a set of fossilized human footprints he saw on display in a small Arizona trading post. Bird was quoted as saying this in Natural History magazine, quote, Yes, they apparently are real enough, real as the rock could be, the strangest things of their kind I have ever seen. On the surface of each was displayed the near likeness of a human foot, perfect in every detail, but each imprint was 15 inches long. Roland T. Bird uh, actually etched his name in paleontological history by coming to Glen Rose and directing the excavation of a series of dinosaur footprints in the Paluxy Basin near the area that is now the state park. The May 1939 Natural History Magazine article was the first and last time Byrd mentioned the human tracks in his writings of the Paluxy fossil tracks. A short time later, a geologist named Clifford L. Burdick was inspired by the article and decided to investigate the Glen Rose tracks. Burdick began his search with the human prints he saw in the article taken from the storefront window in 1945 and managed to locate them in a small museum in Arizona. Now later in 1950, he published a short article entitled, When Giants Roam the Earth, Their Fossil Footprints Still Visible, in the Seventh-day Adventist periodical, Signs of the Times. Burdick continued to research and document the tracks throughout his lifetime, and multiple footprints, both dinosaur and human, were found and extracted from the riverbed. 
the primary reason they were extracted was because when exposed to the weather, they were subject to serious erosion due to the carbonic acid that built up on them. They would be preserved if extracted. You see, erosional factors are at play. Uh, the weatherizing the flow uh, of the river. And uh, when the river gets dry, carbonic acid actually eats into the rock. This is what happens when, over years of time, they get carbonic acid from the rainwater and it just destroys, you know, it just crumbles this rock and it really erodes these tracks and eats them pretty quickly. The legend of the giant man tracks continued to grow stronger when in 1964, Dr. Billy Caldwell, a geologist from Fort Worth, Texas, received a startling revelation. I went into the stone business and started handling building stone for building that we would bring as a geologist. I could bring it from all over the United States. And one day in 1964-65, one of my stone suppliers from Glen Rose, whose name was Bill Osborne, he came in with a pickup truck and the back of the truck said, I want to show you something. And the back of the truck was a piece of Glen Rose limestone. I could still see the fossils in it. It was about uh, four foot by four foot. <clears throat> and it had a perfect human print in it. And so, and I saw there was no differential weathering across and down in the track and up. It was the same weathering all the way across. There wasn't any indication of carving. <clears throat> it was a perfect looking print. And I said to Bill, where'd you get that? And he said, in the middle of the Plexi River, it's been kind of slow, so we got out there with a cold chisel and we spent a week cold chiseling this off. It was uh, four to six inches thick. And uh, so it weighed hundreds of pounds. And <clears throat> then he told me one day, well, I said, that is a really miraculous thing. And uh, I asked him one day, what is he going to do with it? He said, I've had an offer, I think, of $800 from a man in Houston. So I said, well, I sure would like to have a casting of that if you're going to sell it. And so he made me a concrete cast. And that original casting is here in the museum concrete when it was pretty heavy. The real print that Bill Osborne sold was last seen at the 1965 New York World's Fair. It has never been seen since, possibly like the Cook Medical Clinic print and artifacts that counter the evolutionary belief system, it was bought up and hidden away or possibly destroyed. The last scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark where they're there, the storage area where they've hidden the, the Ark. That picture of uh, we have good men working on it, you know, it's hidden. And that's a pretty real depiction. I think they hide more things than they show. And we've run into that several times. In the late 1960s, the Reverend Stanley Taylor from Peoria, Illinois, heard about the human tracks through the writings of Clifford Burdick and went to Glen Rose to investigate for himself. He conducted numerous interviews with old timers, shot 16 millimeter film, and even extended the existing human footprint trails by excavating the overburden along the bank of the river. Fresh new human and dinosaur tracks were found in the same rock layer next to each other, and one of the trails was named the Taylor Trail after its discoverer. A film called Footprints in Stone was made using a 16 millimeter camera and released in 1972. This film showed numerous people putting their feet in the tracks with a near-perfect fit. For at least a decade, this film was shown to numerous church and school groups across the country. I became acquainted with the footprints down here in 1972. The film had just been made, uh, Footprints in Stone. And in fact, it wasn't fully edited, put together, but was shown in raw form. And so I got very excited about that, and I wanted to see them myself. And uh, there were a couple of young teenagers uh, that were skeptics. Uh, their parents attended where I preached. I got them to go with me on this trip. We rented a motorhome. I got to see the footprints, and they got to walk in them and stick their feet in them and feel that they fit. <laughs> and they became devout Christians as a result of that. I saw the effect, and I, I, I believe this was very good evidence. By late 1989, erosion had taken a considerable toll on the Taylor Trail, but at least three of the tracks within the trail still displayed clear human footprint features. 
In 1989, these three tracks were maliciously destroyed. Someone had entered the riverbed and used a metal bar to demolish the remnants of the clearest tracks within the Taylor Trail. Another track researcher was Dr. Cecil N. Doherty, a chiropractor that moved to Glen Rose specifically because of the tracks. He spent 17 years investigating them and photographing them. In 1971, he came out with a book called Valley of the Giants, which gave descriptions, locations, and pictures of the giant human footprints. A friend of mine, Jan Mercer, told me about Dr. Cecil Daugherty, who had found some human tracks in place in situ here. So we contacted him, and we came down here, and he took us to the tracks. They were perfect. They were over in this area, and uh, between Mac Fall and the park here. They were so perfect that it was unbelievable. Sometimes I'd bring them down, the water would be real deep, and we just had to kind of fill them. <clears throat> Other times the water was real low and we could see them. And there was two or three perfect tracks there. Carl Baugh came to Glen Rose in 1981 to excavate some of the dinosaur tracks. Dr. Baugh was a Christian but believed in evolutionary theory and cleaved to the idea that man and dinosaur were separated by 65 million years of time and so was not expecting to discover the shocking revelation that changed his paradigm. So I finally came to Glen Rose. I was completing the Masters in Archaeology. I had referred to the possibility that there were human footprints among dinosaur footprints. So my mentor, Dr. Perfect Wilson, said, if you're going to refer to that, uh, I'm assigning you an actual excavation. You'll need to go to Glen Rose and perform an actual excavation. So I got volunteers and did. At that point, I still personally held to the long ages. I accommodated the dinosaurs in the Mesozoic era of the past, and I felt that there was some substantiation to the geologic column. And then I came to Glen Rose, performed the excavation. And to my absolute amazement, after excavating 19 dinosaur footprints, at the end of that slab, as I excavated through the clay, there was not only really a dinosaur footprint, but 17 and a half inches from the dinosaur footprint, there was a 16 inch human footprint. Now that blew my mind, because my paradigm didn't accept that. In 1984, Dr. Baugh obtained another print from the Paluxy through Clifford Burdick, a geologist from Tucson, Arizona. Uh, Clifford Burdick, geologist, <clears throat> actually bought two uh, prints way back in probably the 1950s in Arizona. He sent one to uh, and at Venice College in the east, they sectioned it, and uh, the laminations were not all that clear. He kept the other. I was able to get the other from him in the 1980s. It was part of his treasure. I was able to get it from him uh, to purchase it. That came from Paluxy. It came from the Paluxy. It came from the area on 67 where the, the bridge crosses 67 and uh, it was excavated there okay. as they were building the bridge, cutting for the bridge. The most recent human footprint finding from the Paluxy River was in 2002. A resident of Stephenville, Texas and amateur fossil hunter Alvis Delk was walking along a tributary of the Paluxy River when he came across a fairly large fossilized rock with a dinosaur footprint in it. The rock was lodged between several other rocks and after about 45 minutes of work, he was able to get the slab loose. He took it home and stored it with the rest of his other fossil findings that he had accumulated through the years. The rock remained uncleaned and stored in his collection until 2008 when he decided to sell some of his fossils. In preparation for selling the rock fossils, he took a soft brush and started to clean the dust and dirt off the slab when it revealed an amazing discovery. Within the tip of the dinosaur footprint was the outline and shape of a human foot. The rock clearly displayed all five toes, instep, and heel partially penetrated by a three-toed theropod type of dinosaur. Here we have a human footprint, 11 and a half inches in length, 
same length as the O.W. Willett print. This was discovered by Alvis Delk. Human footprint stepping first. Stepping on and intruding into the human footprint is an Acrocanthosaurus dinosaur footprint. Notice some of the mud was consolidated in the human footprint and the dinosaur actually pushed it up into the human footprint as he moved forward. Spiral CAT scan technology has been applied in two certified laboratories and is found that under the human track, around it, under and around the dinosaur track, we have the same compression density. So it is genuine. Another significant footprint that Dr. Baugh obtained in 2010 was the O.W. Willett print, which was carved out of a limestone ledge along the banks of the Paluxy River in the 1950s at a location along the river where the current Dinosaur Valley State Park is located. Willett's family was in possession of the print for 60 years and finally decided to sell it to Dr. Baugh's museum. Retired park rangers have told people that they used to have yellow paint sprayed around the human tracks and would point them out to the public when they came to visit. But after evolution became popular in the 1970s, they were forced to tell the public that there were no human tracks in the park. When we investigated Dinosaur Valley State Park, we were told by the park interpreter that there were no human tracks in the park. You're not going to ask me anything about man tracks? If you, if you do not want us to ask you anything about man tracks... I do not want to talk about man tracks. That sounds okay. that's then, fine. Then we, will not, okay. then we won't ask you those questions. Okay. Because there's none in the park. Dinosaur Valley State Park was going to have a grand opening on that weekend and that there was going to be you know, dinosaur footprints and you know that kind of stuff and so we decided let's go check it out so we go there there were signs that were pointing to the different tracks and the different dinosaur tracks and to the human footprints and the dinosaur tracks on the signs the signs were yellow with black letters and they said uh, the names of the dinosaurs that that uh, made those tracks. On the human footprints, on the big ones, there was a sign that was pointing to one of the big ones, and it said uh, caveman tracks. So I got down and, because that really caught my attention, and I started, I put my hand and started feeling that, that human track, that big one. And uh, I never ever heard of such a thing. And I saw the sign, Caveman Tracks, and that got my, my attention. So time went on, a few years. One, uh, one day I was reading in Genesis. And I read, I think it's in Genesis chapter 6, where the Bible says that right before the flood that there was giants on earth. And right when I read that, it was like a slide, a, like a picture in my head. I remember that footprint that I had seen about 12 years before that. There, Dinosaur Valley State Park. And I told my wife, I got up and I told my wife, I, uh, it says here that there used to be giants on the earth. We got to go in the car. We got to go, I got to show you these. So we made a beeline for the state park. 12 years had passed since the time that, that I'd been there with my buddies. And uh, we went, my wife and I, and went down there and we looked and looked and looked. Couldn't find any human footprints anywhere. So go back into the office or there, you know, the area where, you know, the rangers and all the people that work for the park were sitting behind their desks and stuff. And I'll go up to the counter. I said, what happened to those, uh, caveman tracks that y'all used to have out here. And they all looked at me and they didn't say anything. I said, what happened to the human footprints and the caveman tracks that you used to have here? And someone spoke up and said, we never had anything like that out here. I said, oh yes you did, back in 1972. I saw them and my buddy saw them. No, we've never had anything like that. So I left, and we were in the parking lot, but there was an elderly gentleman that was in the, inside, and I didn't notice him, but he followed me outside, and he stopped me in the parking lot. And he said, he said, pardon me, sir, and I said, yes. He said, I heard what you were saying inside. I heard what you were, what you were asking those people in there. He pointed to the, it kind of wooded around in there, it's up in the 
It's hilly and wooded. He pointed through the woods and there was a building, a small building like a shed. And he said, he said, you, those signs that you said you read, the caveman tracks and the dinosaur names that were on those signs, he said, they're in that shed there in the woods. That shed, you see it? I said, yeah, I see it. He said, those signs are in that shed. And I asked him, how do you know? He said, I put them there. And I said, you put them there? He said, yes, I put them there. He said, I used to work here back during that time that you're talking about. And I asked him, I said, well, what happened? And he said, well, they took the signs out and they took the, the, the footprints, they took them out. And I said, well, then they were here. So yeah, they were here. But the human tracks aren't just a local phenomenon. This is a worldwide occurrence. There are fossil footprints in almost every continent of the world. We find them in Asia. We find them in Africa, South Africa. We find them in France, Italy, Australia, Mexico, Central America, Nicaragua. Some of the footprints here locally are in Glen Rose. We also find them in Tennessee and in Kentucky and Oklahoma and Utah and Arizona and Colorado. And so this isn't really isolated to Glen Rose. These fossil footprints can be found on a global scale in many different parts of the world. There, there are two more sites in Texas, down near Sonora, Texas. There's a site where there are five in a right-left pattern that were discovered in the 30s. Uh, A&M came down and studied them and documented them and photographed. I have their photographs. <laughs> they're much more spectacular, than them, but they're still plain. Two or three of them are just spectacular. In Cretaceous limestone, um, that's down at the southern extreme of the state. On the northern extreme, up in the Panhandle, uh, you, you have a, a, another track that was there uh, displayed in the courthouse uh, of Stinnett, Texas, uh, and it was there on display for years. Uh, it caused so much controversy that the fellow that owned it actually removed it, and it's in his home now. But it was, there were actually initially nine tracks. And in 52, they were in the newspaper. And we have the newspaper articles of these nine tracks. Well, one of them has survived. We've learned the location of at least one other. Another amazing track that was found in New Mexico can be seen here. We, we had a mining permit at the time. We had a permit to be there and a permit to excavate. But you have to pass through about five different ranches in order to get to the spot. And the fellow that owned the ranch adjacent to the property, I mean, this was BLM property, the Bureau of Land Management was not his, but he thought it was his. And we had the paper, the permit, he had a shotgun. <laughs> and the shotgun trumps the paper every time we had to leave. But we did get it well documented with cast and photographs, stereo photographs. We did not get the track. In 1968, amateur fossil collector William J. Meister discovered the fossil of a human footprint. When Meister first found the print, he took it to a geologist to examine it. The geologist offered him a quarter of a million dollars for the print. Meister asked, what are you going to do with it if I sell it to you? The geologist responded, I'm going to destroy it. It destroys my entire life's work as a geologist. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. That statement has never been more applicable than in the human footprint controversy. Dr. Patton, in his lifetime of expeditions, has experienced numerous attempts to block, stall, and hinder the finding of the truth regarding man and dinosaur living contemporaneously. When you're messing both with their science and their religion, naturalistic religion, you really raise the ire, and the viciousness is more than is imaginable. Um, this, <laughs> you, you kind of get used to it. You try to work with it and avoid it, but it doesn't surprise and it, uh, it doesn't deter.
This evidence of fossil footprints in stone puts to rest the idea that man and dinosaurs were separated by 65 million years and supports the biblical model of creation. Evolution is a bankrupt theory. However, its defenders, which include humanistic academia and the establishment media, are prepared to defend it to the bitter end. Over the past 200 years, the battle to remove God from the hearts and minds of men has raged on, and many proponents of evolution have used this theory in an attempt to undermine the authority of the Word of God. Any evidence in support of a biblical model of creation, no matter how convincing, will continue to be opposed in support of evolution because of the implications of having the Bible shown to be correct. But what are the implications of the foundational battle of creation versus evolution? Either we arrived by a naturalistic evolutionary progression, or we arrived by special creation. In every major university around the world, in the philosophy department, the four great questions of life are taught, or they're asked, they're never answered. Those four great questions are, who am I? Where did I come from? What's my purpose here? And where am I going? Who am I if evolution is true? Nobody. Where did I come from? I came from a rock. What's my purpose? I'm fertilizer for the future. Where am I going? Nowhere. If evolution is true, this is it. But some creationists hold to evolution and say, well, this is how God did it. If God did it that way, but said he did it otherwise, you can't trust him. You're not going anywhere. If evolution is true. And leading evolutionists have admitted laughingly, some of you Christians hold to evolution and you, you think you're being academic. They're incompatible. It's one way or the other, and they laugh and admit it. So, the other alternative. What if creation is true? If creation is true, who am I? I am an individual originally made in the image of God. Even though I'm really scarred, and I've not lived up to that image as I should have. Originally, I was made in the image of God. If creation is true, who am I? That's who I am. Where did I come from? I came from his direct hand of special creation through Adam and Eve. What's my purpose here? My purpose is first of all to know him, privilege to know him, and then to represent him, to be his ambassador, to speak for him. And the fourth question, where am I going after this is over? I'm going home to be with Him for all eternity, for God inhabits eternity.